He is risen indeed. We begin our Easter service with this traditional centuries-old greeting and affirmation. A joyful, bold, and declarative Christ is risen, followed by the triumphal response and confirmation, He is risen Indeed. Today, all over the world, the greeting, Christ is risen, resounds as a proclamation from the lips of hundreds of millions of people, followed by the celebratory answer from others, He is risen indeed. He's risen indeed. In colloquial terms, we might say, You better believe He's risen. You can take his resurrection to the bank. You bet your bottom dollar he's risen. It's a done deal. This is a day like no other. With all of the jubilation and excitement of savoring a victory, a victory won by Jesus Christ for us and all mankind, not just once and then forgotten, but a victory that is truly once and for all, a victory that has changed the universe for all eternity. Welcome to this victory celebration. Thanks for joining us, for rejoicing with us in the resurrection of our Lord. I'm Greg Albrecht, and this is CWR, Christianity Without the Religion. As a part of our celebration, we begin by being ushered to our places at the banquet table of our King. Paul tells us in Ephesians that we are now seated with him in heavenly places. Right now, in our physical lives, we are now seated with him in heavenly places. And so, as Jesus himself ushers us into the banquet, and as he shows us to our chair, and as we take our place at the table, not earned by us, not paid for by us, but given to us by God's grace, we begin our celebration, and we will embrace and we will partake in this banquet of the bread, the true bread from heaven. If you're in a convenient and safe place and you'd like to join us, we, in the name of Jesus, invite you to prepare an ounce or so of red juice, wine, or liquid, as well as a small piece of bread. In the message that follows our time here at the table of the Lord, In the sermon, we're going to read for our Easter sermon of the account of Jesus and two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We'll read that these two disciples were convinced that Jesus was dead and gone, never to be resurrected. And therefore, they were not expecting Jesus to be walking down the same road they were as they walked away from Jerusalem, going back home to resume their lives. Jesus joined them as they walked along, and they didn't recognize him. They might not have recognized him because he was the last person they were expecting to see, last person they were looking for. Like you or me, after the death of a loved one, we don't expect to see them in line with us at the grocery store. 
or passing us by when we're taking a walk in our neighborhood. Perhaps their own loss of faith, their sheer and deep disappointment that insofar as they knew, Jesus was not risen. Perhaps their grief and depression so preoccupied them, they couldn't focus on anything other than their own pain, and that didn't allow them to recognize Jesus. Whatever the reason may have been, they didn't recognize Jesus until the end of their day's journey. And at the end of that journey, they requested Jesus to join them for an evening meal. Here's what happened next in the words of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, verses 30 through 31. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. The eyes of the two disciples were opened when Jesus sat down with them, as he's sitting down with you and me today at this table. When they took bread, as we are doing, when it was blessed and broken and offered. This, of course, was not the Lord's Supper. Jesus had instituted that with his twelve disciples three nights before. This was simply a normal end-of-the-day meal, but there was nothing simple about it, as it turns out. Even though Jesus, the risen Lord, was their guest, he acted as the host. He took the bread. He gave thanks. He took charge of serving the others. And as he did that, they no doubt began to think of Jesus. When Jesus broke bread and gave thanks, perhaps he did so in a distinctive way that they'd heard and seen many times before. Maybe like when he broke bread and gave thanks before the thousands of people that he fed with just a few loaves and fish. The Gospels, after all, are filled with stories when Jesus acted as host, when he was the chief cook and provider, the feeder, when he provided physical food for others, these stories of a literal event, when Jesus provided spiritual food beyond the literal, are just that. They're far more spiritually significant than they are physical. And it's the same with you and me. Jesus feeds us with himself. He's the true bread who came down from heaven. Bread that imparts eternal life. The true bread that once we receive him, we will never spiritually hunger again, for Jesus is eternal life. As we celebrate his resurrection, we've been seated now by Jesus at his table. He's taking the bread. He's breaking it. He's pouring out the cup for us, just as he poured out his life, the blood of the new covenant, on his cross for you and me. Jesus is our host. He's feeding us, and he will do so continually, now and forevermore. Because, as the title of our message today asserts, Easter never ends. So as we all join together with brothers and sisters all over this world, receiving what Jesus has for us, first let us receive the broken bread that he has blessed, his very body, spiritual food. May this small piece of bread or cracker that you and I have in our hands right now serve for us as a symbol of the body of our risen Lord, the bread which came down from heaven. Let us now receive the body of the Lord. And in the same way, we join together as part of his collective universal body, a part of those who serve him and follow him. And may we now receive the new covenant given to us in and through and by his blood. This is the cup of our risen Lord. May we now receive this cup from him. Join me now in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you in the name of Jesus, in whose name we appear before you and because of whom we have an eternal inheritance you provide by your grace. Thank you for life eternal. Thank you for this grand celebration of our risen Lord, a triumphant, festive, annual event when joy pervades our hearts. We pray your further touch of grace in our lives as we read from the Gospels of Mark and Luke 
as we come to know and believe that Easter never ends. We pray in Jesus' name and conclude with the prayer he gave to teach his disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We began our message today with Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, well, you know, we kind of forgot. His body's in there, and who's going to roll that stone away from the entrance of the tomb so we can get in there to anoint his body? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Let's remember what had happened to Jesus' followers in the aftermath of the crucifixion. The disciples were in hiding. One of them, Judas, has taken his own life. There's a pall of despair and grief that hangs like a low-lying fog over those who trusted that Jesus was Messiah. In spite of their discouragement, three women came to the tomb of Jesus, presuming, of course, that his body was still there. They weren't going to celebrate his resurrection. They didn't believe he was resurrected, as he said he would be. They were going to anoint his body. And, of course, they, when they arrived, or just before they arrived, they wondered, well, oh no, we forgot, how are we going to get into that tomb? It's sealed with this big stone. They found the stone, which sealed the tomb, rolled back, and an angel who looked like a young man in the tomb. As we read what the angel said to these women, we remember that they were still grieving the death of Jesus. They were shocked and overwhelmed by the man they trusted, Jesus. He'd suffered a humiliating and brutal death. With all of this, the wind in the sails of their faith had disappeared. Any faith and hope for a better world that they once had because of Jesus and his preaching and his teaching, that had now ev evaporated. Their hopes and dreams had been dashed. They saw no way of carrying on. The hopes they had, well, that was just a distant dream. It was over, over and done with. But now, in the midst of this dark and depressing time, comes incredible news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's read verses 6 and 7 of Mark chapter 16 again. The angel said to these three women, Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But you go and tell the disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. Jesus is risen. Now, we should note, this doesn't mean that Jesus had returned in the same way to the life that he once had. The word for that kind of event is resuscitation. Jesus resuscitated three people during his earthly ministry, the daughter of Jairus, the son of the widow of Nain, and his friend Lazarus, brother of Martha and Mary. Jesus brought back these three people to life, to the life they had once known. 
these three people Jesus resuscitated. Why do we say resuscitated? Well, we could say resurrected, but they were not resurrected the way Jesus was, nor were they resurrected the way we will be at the second coming of Jesus Christ to eternal life. They were resuscitated because they died again. They simply returned to the flesh and blood chemical existence they had once had. But Jesus was resurrected. He didn't go back to his former earthly life. He was going on. That's what the angel told these three women. He is going on. He's going ahead of you. He was going on to an altogether different phase of his life, if life is the right word to use. Jesus was not resuscitated. He was resurrected. His body was resurrected, never to die again. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. If our hope lies in a man who died, but then was somehow miraculously resuscitated only to die again some years later, then, you know, we don't have a lot of hope, do we? If Easter is a one-time event, just a resuscitation, only to be followed by another death and another burial in a tomb, well, what kind of hope is that? That's not living hope. In verse 7, the women were told to go and tell Peter and the disciples that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. He is going ahead. He's not going back. He's going ahead. He's beginning a completely different life, and so too do we, in Christ, begin a new life. We press on. Jesus' work at that point in time was not over. It was entering into a new phase, and so too does ours. This is just the beginning. Easter is just the beginning. Easter never ends. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He rose, and he remains risen now and forevermore. He is eternally risen. Easter never ends. Earlier, I mentioned that we would read the account in Luke about the two disciples who, upon seeing Jesus die on the cross, were now headed back to their home in Emmaus, some six to seven miles from Jerusalem. I've been to Emmaus. I'm aware of what that trip was like. In fact, though I didn't walk it, I took a taxi from the center of Jerusalem to Emmaus. And so I know the distance they would have walked and basically the topographical terrain that they would have been walking. They were walking away from Jerusalem. They were heading away from what they thought was the dead body of Jesus. For them, it was all over. They believed that Jesus was dead. And so were all of their hopes and dreams. And this is what we read in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, going down to verse 35. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. He joined them, just like a, another traveler. But they were kept from recognizing him. And how they were, I don't know. We speculated earlier in our message how that may have been. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? What are you talking about? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, you got to be the only guy around visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened recently. What things, said Jesus? Well, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village, Emmaus, to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to continue on with his journey, but they urged him, strongly stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day's over, so come on in and stay with us. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. They thought, they had hoped, he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, but their hopes were dashed, because they believe he was not resurrected. Jesus came back in many post-resurrection appearances to his disciples and to his followers, revealing himself to have been resurrected. Jesus revealed himself as the resurrected one who was going on. It wasn't over. It's never over. He was beginning a whole new phase of God's relationship with humanity. That's the takeaway for you and me from this Easter message. What's the takeaway? What would I like you to take with you? Easter never ends. This is not just a day. This is a celebration of a whole new way of life. This is not just a celebration of a resuscitation to a former life. This is a celebration of a resurrection, a transformation, the beginning of an entirely new phase of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and for you and me, an entirely new phase, an ongoing, for those of us who have been transformed in years gone by, an ongoing and continuing part of the life we live by grace in Christ. Christ is risen. That's what we take away from this Easter service. Easter never ends. That's what we take away. This day, and however you physically may celebrate it with friends or family, if you may have a chocolate egg, if you may have an egg roll or looking for hidden eggs with grandchildren or little children, you may enjoy a meal with your family, whatever you may do physically, that's not what this day is about. Those things can add or they can detract from this day. This day has truly eternal, universal import. It is spiritually significant, for it is the very resurrection of Jesus, in whose resurrection we have hope, in whose resurrection and by whose resurrection we now live in Christ, united with him forever and ever. So as we leave the service, let us know and be convicted of the fact that Easter never ends. Christ is risen. Join me now in the triumphant and joyous response to that statement, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Father in heaven, Thank you for this celebration, this celebratory, ongoing event in our lives so that we know the transformation in and through Jesus and our uniting and our union with him will never end. This is a celebration which continues on in heaven forever and ever. Thank you for new life in Christ. Bless us now as we go forth with Jesus, following him wherever he may lead us, in whose name we pray, amen. Thank all of you for joining us for this grand celebration, truly a grand and joyous celebration of the resurrection of our Lord. We invite you back again next week. Next week, we're going to talk about from John chapter 6, verses 41 through 66, the fact that God alone can draw us to Jesus. God alone can draw us to Jesus. That's our message next week. Be sure and join us. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought 
back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. For thine is the key.